In this video, we're going to look at the aluminium electrolytic capacitor. We're going to look at its characteristics, its construction, and the places where it can be used. We'll also look at its drawbacks, so you know how to avoid these being a problem. Huge numbers of these capacitors, both leaded and surface mount, are used in all types of electronic equipment – radios, televisions, Wi-Fi routers, power supplies, and lots of other wonderful pieces of electronic gadgetry. The first question to ask is what is an electrolytic capacitor? Well, it's one that uses an electrolyte between the two capacitor plates. This enables it to have a much higher level of capacitance than other, more straightforward types. Before we move on, let's take a quick look at the basic characteristics of these capacitors. The first thing to note about them is that they are polarised. They have capacitance levels normally in the region of about a microfarad up to around the largest ones maybe 47,000 microfarads or maybe a bit more. As most electronic equipment these days runs on low voltages, working voltages like 16, 25, 50, 63 volts are common, but some are available for high voltage applications with working voltages up to 350 volts or so. Aluminium electrolytics can be used in circuits where a high ripple current is needed, as in power supplies. But these capacitors have a high level of leakage and a poor tolerance or accuracy. And finally, they're no good at radio frequencies. I wouldn't use them much above 100 kHz or so, let alone a megahertz. As a starting point, let's look at the circuit symbol. Here we see the normal circuit symbol for a capacitor and we see it is not polarised. Sometimes a positive sign may be added to this circuit symbol for an electrolytic to show that it's polarised, but more often this symbol is used. And this one may also be seen. The capacitor needs to be connected the right way round, with positive on one end and negative on the other. Electrolytics can be manufactured in a variety of ways, but let's look at one particular example of a way it could be manufactured. There are four layers used in the capacitor. Insulating paper, aluminium foil, tissue to be soaked with the electrolyte and the other aluminium electrode foil. These are all wound together. Often the aluminium foil is chemically etched before being wound to roughen its surface and increase the area and hence the capacitance. Tags are also welded into the foil at suitable points. Once round, the roll is soaked under pressure in the electrolyte. The electrolyte is a mixture of solvents, conducting salts and additives to give it the required properties. Next, the capacitors are placed into cans which are sealed, although vents may be included to relieve the pressure that can build up in operation. At this stage, the anode and cathode are exactly the same. An oxide film is needed on the anode foil and this is created by placing a current limited voltage across the capacitors. This has the effect of producing the required oxide on the anode foil. For very high volume production, this process may be carried out on the aluminium foil before it's actually wound with the other constituents. Aluminium electrolytic capacitors are used in many places in electronic circuits. They may be used as smoothing capacitors, as in this commonly used rectifier circuit. They may be used as bypass capacitors, ensuring supply lines are clean for the different circuit stages in an overall system. Sometimes an electrolytic may be connected across the supply in a particular area of a circuit to provide local decoupling. It's always good practice to throw some occasional electrolytics around on the supplies of large circuits so that low frequency signals are decoupled. Higher frequency decoupling may be achieved using smaller ceramic or other suitable capacitor types, as we see here. For low frequency circuits, even this second decoupling capacitor may be an electrolytic. Electrolytics may also be used for coupling. They are widely used for audio applications where low frequencies combined with lower impedance levels that are found there mean that large capacitance values are needed. In these stages, it is necessary to check the prevailing bias levels with respect to the capacitor polarity, although typical polarities are shown here. Electrolytic capacitors obviously have many specification parameters. The first is obvious. It's the capacitance. As we saw before, this is printed on the case. 
Associated with this is the torrents. The torrents can be an issue. Electrolytics are notoriously poor in this respect. A typical torrents may be something like minus 20 and plus 50%, so don't bank on the value being exact. In the circuit examples we've just seen, the value isn't at all critical, so we're OK. Working voltage. Again, this will be stated on the case. It's chiefly governed by the thickness of the anode foil oxide layer. Broadly speaking, the thicker the oxide, the greater the working voltage. But this reduces the capacitance in a given volume, so the capacitors become bigger for a larger working voltage. Another parameter that's important in some cases is the equivalent series resistance, or ESR. This represents all the ohmic losses in the capacitor, and it can be represented by a single series resistance, shown here as R. It's important that it's low for high current applications. If a high current is drawn, then the capacitor can become too hot, and this could reduce its life, or even cause a failure. Another trait of electrolytic capacitors is that they have a high leakage current compared to other types. The leakage is effectively a resistance between the plates of the capacitor, causing the charge to leak away. For large capacitors, it can be many microamps, and it rises with temperature and with voltage. It can affect some circuits like this op-amp circuit, so don't use electrolytics in areas where even small amounts of leakage may cause a problem. But in most cases, it's not a major issue. When using aluminium electrolytic capacitors, care must be taken to ensure they operate reliably. Here are a few golden rules to note. First, never exceed the rated voltage, otherwise they can fail, sometimes even explosively. Never reverse bias them. This can also lead to failure and explosions. Remember that heat shortens the life of an electrolytic. Keep them cool. I've heard the useful rule of thumb that for every 10 degrees over 85 degrees centigrade, this will halve their life expectancy. Don't use old electrolytics. They can depolarize over time, and if they're not repolarized, then they can have a very high leakage current and fail. Also, old electrolytics can dry out. The electrolyte literally dries up, and in this case their capacitance and general performance drops off significantly, so avoid them if you can. Finally, although electrolytics can have many drawbacks, when used sensibly and within their ratings, they perform very well. It is a matter of using them within their limitations, and then they'll give really good performance.